In 1881, an assassin shot President James A. Garfield just four months into his term, ending this noble leader's plans for carrying out Abraham Lincoln's legacy of equality for formerly enslaved Americans. But how did Garfield get into the big chair? We'll meet the man called the best president we never had next. Today, through the miracle of radio and television, a candidate can speak to literally millions of voters at once. But for more than the first hundred years of our nation's history, it was considered neither dignified nor in good taste for a candidate to go out and solicit votes in his own behalf. The office was supposed to seek the man, and so it did. Hello, and welcome back to the History Author Show. I'm your host, Dean Carianis, and I want to thank you right off the top for making iHeartRadio number one in podcasting. This show happens to be one of the very first on iHeartRadio as we expanded the online offerings. Someday maybe I'll tell you the story of how that came into being, but right now our time machine is going to head back to the hurly-burly of an election, the only one to pit Civil War veterans against each other across the Mason-Dixon line of politics. The democracy, as they called America's oldest political party in those days, ran General Winfield Scott Hancock as their standard bearer, hoping to erase the lingering stigma of white supremacy, slavery, and secession. And in the first presidential showdown after the contested 1876 election, the grand old party chose General James A. Garfield, a young, eloquent, dark horse candidate that nobody much expected. In fact, at the time, he was waiting to take a seat in the U.S. Senate. Then he finds out he's nominated for president, and he wins. That's one of those little nuggets that reminds you of that line at the top by Charles Collingwood, how the office seeks the man in those days. It is that ultimate winner, Garfield, who we meet in the book, The Last Lincoln Republican, The Presidential Election of 1880. Our campaign manager is Benjamin T. Arrington. That's the name on the book cover, but he goes by his middle name, Todd, and that's how I've known him for 10 years, so that's how I'll refer to him throughout this interview. Todd is the site manager of the wonderful James A. Garfield National Historic Site in Mentor, Ohio, and author of The Medal of Honor at Gettysburg, as well as several essays on the Civil War and Reconstruction periods. You can learn more about the 20th president's life and unfulfilled potential at nps.gov slash jaga or on Facebook and Twitter at the handle GarfieldNPS. Okay, now that we've arrived back in the heat of a long ago presidential campaign, let's join Todd Arrington and meet the man he calls the last Lincoln Republican. I'm joined on the line by Todd Arrington, author of The Last Lincoln Republican, The Presidential Election of 1880. Todd, welcome, and thank you so much for making the time to chat with the History Author Show. Hey, Dean. Thanks for having me on. I'm excited to be here. I'm a fan of the show, and now I'm excited to be on here as a guest, so thank you. Well, I was just going to say I'm a fan of you and all the fine work that all of you do there, your team at the Garfield National Historic Site. When you go to this many museums, as many museums as I go to, as many authors that I speak to and people that are passionate about history, there can be a really wide range of things that people do, of how history in many places is still left as very stuffy. Not only do you work at the National Historic Site for James A. Garfield, but now you've written this book about him. So you must get the question, why, a lot. I want to ask it a little bit differently because I know why you're interested in Garfield. He's worth being interested in. <laughs> but what about the general do you find so compelling personally? Something I've never asked you in all the years I've known you. Yeah, no, great question. And there's a number of things and ways that I could answer that. Primarily, of course, my interest in Garfield started because of my job. I got hired to work at this site I've been in the National Park Service for about 21 years now, and uh, the last 11 of those years have been here in Mentor, Ohio, at James A. Garfield National Historic Site. Now, I am a historian of American history, particularly 19th century politics, and I have a very strong interest in the early Republican Party. 
But I admit when I came here, I really didn't know that much about James Garfield. And so I realized that there was going to be, you know, a very steep learning curve for me to learn more about him. And I got very lucky that when I got here, there were a number of excellent co-workers, many of whom are still there working with me every day, who have been there for a very long time and they knew Garfield really well and they were able to tell me things that I wouldn't have known otherwise and they were able to point me in the right direction of books and things to read. And, and as I got to know more about Garfield, I just really developed a very strong affinity for the man. I, I think he was an impressive human being. He was certainly an impressive political figure. And I think he's highly underappreciated as a political figure in American history. The thing that I really tried to look at primarily in the book was how different things may have been had he lived because he did have this very, very strong record on civil rights. And the year that he's elected is 1880. And by then, you know, you have a lot of Republicans kind of starting to move away from civil rights as a major issue and move on towards other things. And they're looking for all these new alliances with industrialists and financiers. And this is when the Republican Party is really on its way to becoming known as the party of big business. And that then you have James Garfield, who, you know, very few people, at least at that point, figured had any chance to be elected president in 1880. And one of those people who didn't think he had any chance to be elected president was Garfield himself. He turns out to be one of the most vocal Republicans who is still really saying to the Republican Party, we still have a lot of work to do on race and on civil rights. And uh, we have millions of formerly enslaved people in the South that are still looking to us to help the country fulfill its promise to them. So I think he's very underappreciated for that reason as well. So there's just a lot to like about the man, and that's probably the easiest way to answer the question. Yeah, you can hear right away the passion that you're going to be getting when you pick up the last Lincoln Republican and look at this man's life rather than just his long lingering death. When somebody's shot, when they die violently, we tend to just identify them there. His life starts with the flash of that gun in the train station, and then he's dead. And before Candace Millard's great book, Destiny of the Republic, that's all people might know when they came to the historic site. They would know, okay, he had a beard, he was killed in office, and there's a cartoon cat that for some reason has the same name. And that reason is that Jim Davis, the cartoonist, that was his grandfather's name. And also that tells you that this guy was pretty special. Not everybody names their kid after a president. So he still was remembered, still was revered. And you don't think about how he got there. How did he get to the big chair? That's a big question that you answer here. And I am somebody who's into politics. And I, and I realized I'd made a little bit of that sin in history where you just assume, well, of course, Garfield was president. And of course, he was going to get shot. <laughs> it's not the case. Nobody's guaranteed to win the presidency. He faces off against General Winfield Scott Hancock. They both won the same number of states in, in the country, a close election. And then I thought Gateau, who is the man who shoots Garfield, and I'm kind of kicking myself here because I, I don't like to mention the assassin if I can <laughs> avoid it, but it's a guy who is also a blank slate. You say, well, okay, so that guy would have been president instead of Garfield. It wouldn't have mattered. But <laughs> Here, this guy probably wouldn't have been targeted by this lunatic assassin. General Winfield Scott Hancock, not to be confused with General Winfield Scott, <laughs> is a guy that is a big question mark. So you just assume that, okay, he would have spent his four years and been just as boring and inconsequential as we wrongly assume all those Gilded Age presidents were. So here Garfield is a what if, but Hancock is a different sort of what if. He goes on to serve four years. How is maybe our country today in 2020 and those years that followed, especially for the freedmen, different if Hancock wins this election in 1880 instead of your man, Jim Garfield? Well, that's a great question. And I mean, I think what you really have to look at here, because you're right, they win. Garfield's popular vote margin is something less than 10,000 votes out of however many million were cast in 1880. Granted, the Electoral College majority is much more substantial, but it, it's, you know, on the popular vote side, it's a very close election. I think it is worth mentioning that obviously my work is all about James Garfield and what I do every day at the site is about James Garfield. Winfield Scott Hancock does deserve at least to be mentioned. And I do, of course, spend some time on him in the book as well. Hancock is you know, he's a lifelong Democrat. Everybody knew he had presidential ambitions, even though he'd never been elected to office before. You know, Hancock, I think, just 
his biggest problem in 1880 was just the party that he was the candidate of. And there was just so much ugliness in the Democratic Party at that point, especially in the South. But, you know, Hancock is certainly someone who deserves a lot of credit, I think, not only for the many the decades of service he gave to the country and the army, but um, when he lost this razor thin election, and again Garfield beats him by roughly ten thousand popular votes or less out of however many millions are cast, he immediately accepted that and said, "Okay, I can stand it." According to the story, you know, his wife told him you lost, and he said, "Okay, I can stand it," and he rolled over and went back to sleep. He didn't protest. He didn't demand recounts. He just accepted, okay, you know, I, I gave it a shot and, and I lost barely and, and so much for that. I think what you have to do there is really look at the parties. Yes, Republicans, a lot of Republicans at least, were kind of starting to move away from issues of race and civil rights until somebody like Garfield came along and reminded them of who they really were and what their obligations were, again, to make sure that, that African Americans were given all the opportunities possible to take advantage of, you know, citizenship and suffrage and all these things that came out of the the Civil War and the Reconstruction Amendments to the Constitution. But what about the Democratic Party? Well, if the Democratic Party at that point really is, is, at least in the South, is very much all in unabashedly promoting white supremacy and trying to return power, as much power as possible politically and socially and economically to white men. And so, you know, really, I think that you have to look at the two parties and kind of where the two parties were going uh, at that point. And, you know, the Republicans were, I think, starting to maybe slide off the rails just a bit but fortunately, they had Garfield to pull them back in. And that, to me, is the real tragedy of his death, how the Republican Party might have saved itself and obviously what may have come to pass for freed men and women in the South. You know, Hancock is an interesting guy because this is the only election in American history where you have two guys from you know the major parties running against each other who are both Union Civil War veterans. And so it's going to be pretty hard for somebody like Garfield and the Republicans to wave the bloody shirt in the face of Winfield Scott Hancock, who fought for the North, fought for the United States, bled for the United States. You know, you can't accuse him of putting Northern soldiers in their graves like you can white Southern Democrats at that point. So waving the bloody shirt, and I think that's part of the reason that the Democrats chose Hancock, was they were tired of losing these elections to Republicans who, anytime they got backed into a corner, could just figuratively wave that bloody shirt and say, well, you know, we were loyal to the to the Union, we freed the slaves, and we didn't put 300,000 Northern boys in premature graves. Well, they couldn't do that to Hancock, and I think that's part of the reason the vote was so close. So I think at that point, to try to figure out the differences between the two. You really have to look at where the parties were going. And you probably know Heather Cox Richardson, who's, of course, a, you know, an amazing historian and, and sort of a public intellectual. And, um, you know, she's written an, she wrote an excellent book a few years ago called To Make Men Free. It was a history of the Republican Party. And she kind of shows in that book, I think, masterfully how the Republicans kind of have lost their way several times over the years. And they've always managed to course correct because of these, what she calls transformative figures. And of course, the three major ones that she points out are Abraham Lincoln, Theodore Roosevelt, and Dwight D. Eisenhower. I don't know if James Garfield would have been one of those figures had he lived. Maybe he would have been, maybe he wouldn't have been. But I do think he had all the makings of an excellent president. And I certainly think that he may have been able to have a, a very positive impact on race relations and civil rights. Now, with that, you get close to home, literally for you, but for me, the presidency of William McKinley that I've spoken about a lot on the show, here's a guy in Theodore Roosevelt who's the Rolling Stones. <laughs> McKinley was like the opening act for the Rolling Stones. There's this great picture of the two of them together, even where Roosevelt's his face is a blur. Here, McKinley's standing there still, like you had to for pictures in those days, and of course, there's Theodore Roosevelt with, he's looking, he's distracted, he's on all that coffee, and he's just, <laughs> I call it Bill and Ted's excellent adventure yeah, in the photo. <laughs> McKinley was much more dedicated to the freedmen than I think we give him credit for, because, and even Roosevelt wasn't for McKinley, he was for a much more staid establishment candidate in 
in the days of the 1896 election. He didn't want McKinley. He thought McKinley was too far to the left. That's why I'm looking forward to interviewing Ben Justison about his book. It's called Forgotten Legacy, William McKinley, George Henry White, and the Struggle for Black Equality. He asked me some questions for you when I emailed him, and I've shared these with you, so I'm not ambushing you with these gentle listeners. (laughs) He said James Garfield belongs to a proud tradition of Ohio Republicans who publicly supported abolition of slavery and black voting rights as president. And that included his successors, Benjamin Harrison and William McKinley. Both men supported the unsuccessful Federal Elections Act in 1890, which guaranteed black voting rights. And he asks, had he lived, Garfield would undoubtedly have supported that as well. So do you perhaps see those two men, Harrison and McKinley, as Garfield heirs more than Lincoln Republicans? Oh, that's well, that is an interesting question. And, and, and I like that question a lot. I certainly as a Garfield partisan, uh, <laughs> I, I like to think that, you know, had Garfield lived, maybe, yes, he would be as revered as Lincoln, although I don't know how realistic that really is. I mean, I'm not sure anyone will ever be as revered as as Lincoln in American history. But, you know, I, I guess that's possible. I, I think if nothing else, then perhaps presidents who came later after Garfield, had Garfield lived and served a full term or or maybe two full terms, I certainly think that presidents like, whether it's Harrison or McKinley, and of course, who's to say that Harrison or McKinley would ever even have been president had Garfield lived and served a full term or two terms. I mean, it's just so many what ifs when you're considering things like this. But I'd like to think that maybe they certainly would have pointed out Garfield's record as something to be particularly proud of as Republicans and something that maybe they would have used to rally other Republicans to say, our work is not done, and this is who we really are. This is why our party was founded, was to try to promote at least some degree of equality among Americans, racial equality, economic equality, political equality. And so I'd like to think that, yeah, maybe Garfield's record would, at least he may not have risen to Lincoln's level, but I certainly would like to think that his record would be one that future presidents, future Republicans especially, would have held up proudly and said, you know, this is a great step on the road that we're we're continuing to walk down. Well, that brings me to a combination of another thing that Ben Justison observed when you title your book, The Last Lincoln Republican, when you look back now at this man who stares at us from every penny and every five dollar bill, it's easy to think, well, everybody revered Lincoln back then. And of course, that's not the case. Even after his assassination, he wasn't, although that is, as they say, as you're familiar with, it is a resume enhancement in the crass language of history. (laughs) But Garfield, although you title the book The Last Lincoln Republican, he wasn't all in on Honest Abe. He had cold contempt for him, as you quote one historian saying. He was a Civil War Union veteran, as were Hayes, Harrison, and McKinley. And they had Lincoln as their commander in chief, right? And yet they all become president and they all support black suffrage, which is a cause Lincoln himself didn't embrace. We can't know what would have happened in the rest of his term either. It's also a what if question. So Ben Justison, author of Forgotten Legacy about William McKinley and his struggle for black equality, asked, To what extent was their battlefield service, those four Union veteran presidents, including alongside black soldiers, a defining factor in their commitment to a cause that Lincoln himself, the great emancipator, didn't support? Well, Lincoln was starting to get to coming around to that idea. And I think, you know, in, in, in one of the very last speeches he gave, and in fact, it may be the very last speech, and if I remember correctly, it's the one where supposedly John Wilkes Booth was in the crowd, which he gave from the, the White House. I think it was around April 11th right. of 1865, something like that. And of course, you know, Booth shoots him three nights later. Lincoln sort of floated the idea of, well, you know, maybe giving the most intelligent of black men the vote. And then, of course, supposedly this is when Booth says, well, that means, you know, African suffrage, although he didn't say African. And that's the last speech he'll ever give. And supposedly that's when Booth decides this is no longer a kidnapping plot. It's a murder plot. Some of that may be somewhat, you know, uh, apocryphal. Yeah, apocryphal. Yeah. There's no question he was there, though, and I'm sure he didn't like hearing it. Yeah, certainly not. And (laughs) one of the great ironies of history that I always point out is that Booth thinks he's avenging the South by killing Lincoln. And in fact, he's killing the South's best friend because 
you know, once Lincoln died, then it was was on to Andrew Johnson trying very poorly <laughs> to institute Lincoln's program, and then of course radical re- Republican Reconstruction. So Booth really uh, ended up doing more, much more damage to the South than uh, than Abraham Lincoln could ever have done. But anyway, somebody like Garfield, who was very vocally anti-slavery before the Civil War. And then when the war starts, sees it as an obligation and and a necessity to go and fight. And then during the war, gets elected to Congress and goes and really spends the last year and a half or so of the Civil War as a member of Congress rather than in uniform uh, in the Army. But, you know, yes, I think the battlefield experience probably hardened feelings that Garfield already had. You know, as I said, he was very vocally anti-slavery before the war began. And if you read some of the letters he wrote to his wife or to friends during the war, if you read some of the, uh, the the diary entries that he made during the war, you see that he's hardening for sure on, and he says at one point, slavery is the soul of the rebellion and the devil incarnate, which must be cast out before we can trust in any peace as lasting and secure. So, you know, he realizes very early on, this is all about slavery. Slavery is the root cause. Yes, states' rights and con- the Constitution and economics and all this other stuff that that even today people like to bring up. Yes, those things are all factors, but they all ultimately lead back to disputes over slavery and specifically the expansion of slavery, which was really the, the South's main point of contention was they wanted slavery to be able to expand. So I think you know being on the battlefield and seeing men die for what Garfield correctly called – a war about slavery uh, certainly did harden him to Southerners, to the institution of slavery, and to what he thought needed to be done after the war ended. And I don't know as much about how Hayes or Harrison or anybody like that or McKinley felt about it, but I would suspect at least some of that was the same for them. One of my favorite things about McKinley, which really is not to your question, but I'll say it anyway, since I know you're a McKinley fan. Uh, I'm looking right at his signature here. That oh, my wife got me for one of my birthdays, a nice picture of him with a signature off one of his checks. So lay it on me. If ever you were going to tell somebody a good thing about McKinley. Well, <laughs> and this, is, this will not be anything you haven't heard a million times, but <laughs> I really love that McKinley had the courage to really resist going to war immediately with Spain And he said, you know, hey, I have seen one war. I don't want to see another one. You don't put McKinley in that category of, you know, some of these guys after the war who, you know, sort of said, oh, it doesn't matter what it was all about. Oh, everybody was brave. Let's all have an encampment and a a reenactment. McKinley was very vocally saying, no, it's war is terrible and we shouldn't rush into it and we shouldn't do it if it's not absolutely necessary. So I've always liked that about McKinley. TR for all the way people praise him today and my eyes just drifted over to david mccullough's book on my, and he's oh. looking at me sorry tr i'm gonna say it you were pushing for that war you were the war hawk let's get down there let's heck you wanted to drive the european flag out of north america as you put it and <laughs> someone had to say to you good god roosevelt what's wrong with canada and he he would have found something if he, if he had to sure it was a good balance we talk about balance and presidential tickets the young, the vigorous, and here you had the wisdom of a senior statesman who had been in the war, who'd seen the blood, and was going to do this amazing thing for American presidents and resist a war. Congress was threatening to declare war on Spain over his head and make him his commander-in-chief prosecute a war he didn't believe in or want. Yeah, and again, you you know, I'm not telling you anything you don't know, but Roosevelt, of course, is is very young, and Roosevelt's you know a student of history, and he's one of these guys that reveres the Civil War generation. And he sees war as the ultimate kind of masculine, manly contest. And, you know, he'd be one of those guys today that would say, oh, you know, this country's getting soft. We need a good war, which is, of course, a ridiculous sentiment. But (laughs) is what he said. Yeah. Well, yeah. (laughs) It had been too long, he felt. Yeah. okay. But he went. He went and fought. So you got to give him that. He wanted a war so he could prove, you know, how masculine he was and that Americans had not gotten soft, as he would have put it. So for all the great things that we love about Roosevelt, he, like like any figure in history, is is far from perfect. And so that's one thing we can say, well, maybe a little bit of youthful, impetuous nature there on, on, on his part when it came to, to war. But hey, the, you know, that war certainly did make the rest of his career. So I guess, you know, if we're happy that Roosevelt was president at some point, then I guess we have to say that that was one good thing, at least to come out of the Spanish-American War. 
well like going to war. He'll push his way into this conversation on the last <laughs> Lincoln Republican if we let him. So I'm going to set him aside, get back to Garfield. You have a chapter in the last Lincoln Republican, actually your very first one, and it's titled Halfway Between God and the Devil, the Election of 1876 and its Aftermath. The stage is set in 1880 for another knockdown drag out. It's a very divided time. It really reminds me of today because we also have very narrow margins in Congress. We have two presidents, not Garfield, but his predecessor, Hayes, who wins the Electoral College vote, but not the popular vote. Garfield, as you mentioned, he has a very narrow popular vote, dividing him from Hancock. Here you have these guys duking it out in 76 because it's a disputed election. There's three states. People may recall, if they're old enough, 2000, now 2000 even, our disputed election is 20 years ago. But we did just have another election where one candidate won the popular vote and another won the Electoral College and was therefore constitutionally installed as the president. So set the stage for us as 1880 approaches. You said Garfield didn't intend to win. Nobody thought that he would get the nomination, then go on to the presidency. He ends up bustled in there. What's the shadow of the 1876 election? It's decided, unlike 2000, by an electoral commission that Garfield opposes. He says this is unconstitutional. There's no, there's nothing in the Constitution that talks about a commission to decide what electors are seated and what aren't. The framers never pictured a case where you'd have two sets of electors from, in, from individual states. But then he's put on this commission, and he ends up serving and trying to do the right thing, as I think Garfield always did. So Rutherford B. Hayes ends up in the White House. It has to cast a shadow over the nominating process in 1880 and the election. How does Garfield deal with that? Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that he was part of that commission, even after he had spoken out and said, this commission is a terrible idea. <laughs> I chalked that up to no good deed goes unpunished, I guess, that he spoke up and said he doesn't like this idea. So they made him a member of the commission. <laughs> and, yeah. you know, once he got on the commission, you know, he admittedly was partisan and definitely was in favor of Hayes, regardless of what the facts showed about the popular vote or what happened specifically in Louisiana, because Garfield was dispatched by President Grant down to Louisiana to be sort of an observer of the, the recounts and everything down there. But, you know, the interesting thing about, and I, and I make this point in the book that, you know, the 1880 election really started in 1876 because even before the dispute, so before the presidential election was even held, Rutherford B. Hayes publicly says in his letter of acceptance in July of 1876, he's only going, if he wins, he's only going to serve one term. He has already told the country he is not seeking re-election in 1880. So the Republicans knew for four years that they needed a candidate in 1880. So the question naturally became, who was that candidate going to be when they didn't have an incumbent president who was seeking renomination to run for a second term? And of course, uh, Grant had served two terms as president, was still immensely personally popular. Obviously, everybody knows that his presidency had some scandals. His presidency, I think, is getting quite a fresh look from historians now. And I'm glad for that because I think Grant was far better as a president than he's been given credit for. Certainly very strong on civil rights and taking on the Ku Klux Klan and all this kind of stuff, which were all, you know, hugely important things. That's another example, as you were talking about before, you know, people kind of getting passed over quickly in history. Well, you know, Grant was a great general and, you know, he's just, he's not a great president, lots of scandals. And then, you know, I, I make the point in the book that a lot of the public and even really scholars, too, until fairly recently, at least some of them really treated the presidency as kind of a black hole from the time of Abraham Lincoln up until about Theodore Roosevelt. And it's just not the case. And you have all these amazing people and, and accomplished people who are serving as president, including Grant and Garfield. But anyway, in 1880, Republicans know they need a candidate. And so Grant is not opposed to being nominated to run again. He's been gone for going on four years now, and he doesn't like the direction the party has gone under Hayes. His wife very much wants to be president again. He certainly is wisely listening to her. And so um, he's not opposed to being nominated again. So a lot of people really expected Ulysses S. Grant to be the nominee in 1880. There were a lot of people out there, even loyal Republicans, who just were opposed to anyone getting a third term. That was made them uncomfortable. 
not because of any constitutional amendment that didn't exist until the early 1950s that said presidents could only serve two terms, but it was really just because of that example that had been set by George Washington, who served two terms and then voluntarily walked away from power when he could have been elected again and again. And so a lot of people, including James Garfield, did not think that anyone should seek a third term. And so there were other people seeking the nomination in 1880. The other two besides Grant primarily were James G. Blaine, who was a senator from Maine, and John Sherman, a fellow Ohioan to Garfield, who was at that point serving as Secretary of the Treasury for President Hayes. So Sherman and Garfield obviously knew each other, both being from Ohio. Sherman had supported Garfield in early 1880 for election to the U.S. Senate. So the Ohio legislature had elected Garfield to the Senate in January of 1880. So at the beginning of 1881, James Garfield was due to leave the House of Representatives, where he'd been for 17 years, and go become a U.S. senator. And the price for Sherman kind of quietly behind the scenes supporting Garfield in that endeavor was that Sherman wanted Garfield's support for Sherman seeking the Republican presidential nomination. Garfield agreed to give it. And then, of course, as the Republican National Convention drew closer and closer, Sherman started making more and more demands on Garfield to the point that he finally asked Garfield to go to the convention, not only manage Sherman's efforts at the convention, but eventually give the speech nominating Sherman to be the Republican nominee. And so that's the story sort of of how Garfield came to actually be at the convention that nominated him for president, which I believe was the first time in American history that a presidential nominee was actually present at the convention that nominated him. But of course, he wasn't there to run for the nomination. He was there to nominate someone else. I like that you talk about the run-up to the election and the factions in the Republican Party because it is something that indirectly ends up spelling doom for Garfield, this battle over who's going to be president, in part because of the spoilsmen, right? The men who wanted spoils and the stalwart faction of Republicans that were for Grant. This ends up inspiring this crazy man who shoots Garfield. And in fact, I was going to say to you, well, didn't Charles Gateau really play a huge role in nominating Garfield because he <laughs> thought he did, but I decided I didn't want you to strangle me for, <laughs> but that was his delusion. Certainly in his own mind, Gateau played a major <laughs> role, but you know, in here in the real world where we all live and, and where James Garfield was living, no, Gateau was, was a non-factor there and, and, until of course, July 2nd, 1881, when, when he became a major factor. And there's a few books I've done on Grant but also you have publishers that aren't interested in those black and white bearded presidents. Before they really saw history, could take hold in the hands of somebody like David McCullough, who I remember speaking to one of your colleagues there at the Adams National Historic Site, and he said, if anyone had come in here before that book and said, John Adams was their favorite president, I would have called them a liar <laughs> because no, you know, nobody knew. We didn't get the foot traffic. It was, okay, here's this guy sandwiched in between Washington and Jefferson and wasn't very consequential or very interesting. And then in the hands of a skilled historian, he comes to life, just like here in The Last Lincoln Republican. You bring Garfield to life and you remind us of the important things he did. I interviewed Donald L. Miller, his book called Vicksburg on Grant. Paul Cahan, the presidency of Ulysses S. Grant, which makes use of some of those new sources that have been released that you were invoking a few minutes ago, and also Sam Gwynn, S.C. Gwynn, his book, Hymns of the Republic, which is the final year of the Civil War, talks also a lot about Grant. So there are stories that are as yet untold, and I think the important thing about a book like The Presidency of Ulysses S. Grant by Paul Cahan is that too often we take for granted the conventional wisdom that, oh, Garfield, he's not very interesting. There's really not much to find. But that's not the case. And especially now, you can find so much more. Never mind new papers of a president being released. But I think it's fascinating that you're the person that usually my guests go to. They'll say, I went to the Garfield Center. And I spoke <laughs> to Todd Arrington. He told me so much about Garfield. Most people say, I know nothing. They picture the orange cartoon cat. And <laughs> that's about it when they hear Garfield. Yeah, and... and we had a similar experience to the Adams folks that you mentioned about David McCullough's book. We had a similar experience going on, I guess, about nine or 10 years ago now, 
when Candace Millard's book came out, Destiny of the Republic, which I think you mentioned earlier. There have been other Garfield books. Of course, Alan Peskin, he wrote Garfield. It's just called Garfield. That's the sort of authoritative academic biography, which came out in the late 1970s, but it holds up very well, still really good. And then uh, Kenneth Ackerman wrote Dark Horse around 2003 or so, and that's just a fantastic book as well, really, really strong on helping you understand the politics, the stalwarts and the half-breeds, and what are these guys really fighting about, and how does this lead Gateau to shoot Garfield? And then, of course, Candace's book is a New York Times bestseller that gets made into a, an American Experience documentary, and, and so we had that experience, too, with with Destiny of the Republic when people came in and said, I never knew anything about Garfield, but wow, now I'm fascinated by him. And, and of course, that's music to our ears because we want people to have a better appreciation for who he was and, and understand more about what he might have accomplished and what he did accomplish. I mean, he lived for 49 years, so tragically a, a very young man when he died, but still he did a lot in 49 years that is worthy of remembrance, not just become an accidental president, even though, of course, I, I reject that term, <laughs> you know, more than just become an accidental president and have a very impressive beard and then get shot, linger and finally die after 80 days of, of suffering at the hands of poorly trained doctors or, or doctors who are, you know, have a fair amount of hubris, I guess. So yeah, we've had that experience as well. So as much as I appreciate people being interested in my book, including you, Dean, I'm standing on some very tall shoulders here with people like Candace and Ken Ackerman and, and Alan Peskin. And that's another term that reminds me of this theme where you dismiss somebody as an accidental president. And then by definition, who wants to write about an accident? Sure. Who thinks they're going to make their life out of an accident? It's not something that tempts you. And people people have so much to study in history. For instance, when I interviewed David Petrusha, I'm going to go through all my previous interviews here, it seems like. But <laughs> okay. I interviewed him about his book, TR's Last War. And he said, nobody really focused on the Great War at the end of TR's life because by that point, you're just so exhausted by the guy. Yeah. And you just say, my gosh, let's just say the war came, his son served, his favorite son got killed, and here's the epilogue. Right. It is exhausting, and you have to keep the book a certain length. I liked reading about Garfield before the Millard book, before reading your book, obviously, before I even went out to Mentor, Ohio, which is a lovely historic site. I like to imagine it really takes on his personality because it is a very comforting, quiet, beautiful place. It's well-maintained. You can see his house, even some additions that post-date his life that his, his widow would have added on. I read even that book you mentioned, the Garfield book, with just the word Garfield on the spine. And I think I've told you this story once that I was in the Port Authority bus terminal reading the book. And a fellow came up to me, tall guy, big guy, and he said, Garfield, is, is that about the president? And I said, yes. And to myself, I'm thinking, well, I'm, I ain't reading a 550-page book on the <laughs> orange cartoon cat. On the cat, you know? yeah. <laughs> and he said, oh, that was my great-grandfather, great-great-grandfather or something. Wow. I'm just reading these stories about him. And so I blurt out, you know, he could lift up a whole cask of beer and drink <laughs> it out of the bunghole. His grandfather could too. They were really big guys. I just blurred out a bunch of stuff about how cool this fellow's ancestor was. And then he got on the bus and sat somewhere else. <laughs> and I, re <laughs> I realized I probably just gushed a little bit too much about Garfield. But that's the kind of excitement that I find. And that's why I was excited to hear about your book, The Last Lincoln Republican. It doesn't mean that he's somebody who was perfect. He had problems of his own. He had uh, one moral failing that's kind of a little bit murky in history about a personal affair. And you even write in The Last Lincoln Republican that some things Garfield said and wrote privately might make us cringe today. As great as somebody might be in history, as much as we like them, they didn't have great days every day. They raised their voices. They got mad. They stumbled. But that's why it makes it so much more inspiring when they get back up to their feet, as Garfield did. So he, he'd he risked his life to end slavery. It doesn't excuse everything in his life, but I think we live in a current climate where we're going to judge everybody on their worst moment, their worst letter, their worst moral failing. Why do the positives of Garfield's character and career shine through from the pages of history? Why are those the things that you think we should remember him for in full context? Well, I mean, I think all the things you, that you've pointed out, Dean, show one thing, and that is that, yes, in fact, Garfield was a human being, and he wasn't perfect. And that's the problem we have with historical figures. We expect them to have been perfect, and they weren't because they were human beings. Now, that doesn't mean that we can't explore the things about them that were imperfect. And, you know, I think probably the easiest example, but I 
still a very valid example is the fact that the founding fathers were brilliant men and they did this amazing thing creating this country and all men are created equal. And yet many of them were slave owners. How do we reconcile these things? It seems as if sometimes there were two sides or more than two sides really to some of these guys. James Garfield is a human being just like George Washington and Thomas Jefferson and the found, you know, all of the founders. And so, yes, he, he accomplished some amazing things, but he had he had a life and he had a family and he had troubles in his life. He, he had illnesses. You know, the first several years of his marriage were very unhappy. He at one point actually told his wife he thought that the marriage had been a mistake, just what every young bride wants to hear a couple of years into the marriage. And so he wasn't a perfect guy. And, and I think to me, those are the things that even though that aspect of Garfield's life is not what you know my research has focused on, I do think those are the things that make historical figures interesting is when you find out who were they for real? What were their failings? Because to me, that makes them human. It makes them seem relatable because you have failings. I have failings. We, we've all made mistakes. We've all done things that, you know, in hindsight, we say, oh, that was pretty dumb. You know, we, we've all done that. And James Garfield <laughs> did that, too. So that makes them more relatable as human beings. But I think it also reinforces just how great the great things really are. And so, you know, this guy was able to rise above whatever personal failings he had and still take this very strong moral position against slavery. Yeah, he did say some things, a few things here and there in his diaries or his letters that we would probably think of today as being a little uh, – certainly not politically correct. He didn't support the idea of women voting. Here he had a wife and a daughter. He stated that, you know, he was in favor of anything that would improve woman's condition, but he didn't think voting would accomplish that. We want our historical heroes to be perfect, and they're just not because they were human beings. But I think what's important about Garfield, of course, is what he did accomplish, uh, whether it's as a, as a scholar and an academic, because that's what he was before he became a, a general and a, poli and a politician, or whether it's the stands that he took. And I make the point in the book that, hey, you know, he might have said some things that maybe may would make us a little uncomfortable today in 2020, but he was extremely reliable when it came time to speak up and to vote as a member of Congress. And so he spoke up and he voted the way that we hope that someone in his position would have voted. And so that's one of the things that I kind of say all the time at, at the site where I work is, you know, we're so lucky that we have a figure here that we, whose life we interpret and commemorate, that the more you get to know him, the more you like him. He's a very easy guy to like. Imagine going to work every day at Andrew Johnson National Historic Site, for example. Not to pick on my friends at, in Tennessee at that site. It's just he's a figure that the more that comes out about the things he said and did, uh, the less you probably like him. But it's a beautiful site. And of course, all the National Park Service people there are wonderful, obviously, because they're National Park Service people and they're my colleagues and, and they're, they're doing a great job. But it, it is nice to have a place where people are starting to realize more about who Garfield was, what he accomplished, and why he is important to remember and is not just an accidental president or a, or a footnote in history. He was a real person who lived and breathed, who had a family, who died very young, very tragically, and, 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 and didn't have to die. That's one of the really most tragic parts of his story is, you know, despite the fact that he was shot, he certainly could have lived if the doctors had just done some things differently. But because of books like Candace Millard's and Ken Ackerman's and things like PBS documentaries, and I'd like to think some of the work that we do every day too, people are waking up to who this guy was and realizing he was a very impressive individual and certainly could have been a great president. You're enjoying my conversation with Todd Arrington about his book, The Last Lincoln Republican, The Presidential Election of 1880. Enjoy how Todd and his team at the James A. Garfield National Historic Site keep the 20th president's story alive. You could do that by visiting them in person if you can make the trip to Mentor, Ohio, or you can find them online at nps.gov slash J-A-G-A or on Facebook and Twitter at the handles Garfield NPS. Candace Millard, who we've been mentioning throughout our conversation today, wrote that Garfield epic called Destiny of the Republic, a tale of madness, medicine, and the murder of a president. She writes of the last Lincoln Republican, quote, 
making masterful use not only of a vast array of primary sources, but also of his own voluminous knowledge. Benjamin Arrington has written a clear-eyed, fast-paced, important new book about one of the most fraught and fascinating presidential elections in our nation's history. Todd, that's what a good writer could do with words, but you put a great book in her hand, and so that enabled her to really sing its praises honestly and to the fullest. I interviewed her about her book, Hero of the Empire, The Boer War, A Daring Escape, and The Making of Winston Churchill. And much as I said about TR a few minutes ago, Garfield kept trying to get into that conversation too, but he's much more polite and willing to wait his (laughs) turn than is TR, all due respect, to the Rough Rider. He's not charging in and trying to take over. It's been great to get to know her. She was part of this group that secured the DC Waysides that I wanted to ask you about. But first, I asked her to suggest a question for our chat today, and she graciously agreed. She wanted to ask you what you learned about Garfield or the people around him or his time, the era he lived in, while you were writing this book that surprised you, that you didn't already know after years of running the JAG National Historic Site. Well, I should have known that Candace would come up with a great question. The angle of Garfield's involvement with civil rights, and and I realized that I probably did know some about that prior to starting to write the book, but I think my appreciation for him sort of standing on the right side of history on that issue really grew a lot as as I researched and read and, and wrote the book, certainly because of the time that we're living in right now and we're seeing things like the Black Lives Matter protests and a significant segment of our population that is saying, you know, we are still not fully equal before the law or in the eyes of society. I just like to wonder if if perhaps those things might have been a little bit better and a little bit different had somebody like James Garfield lived to serve out his full term as president. Maybe they wouldn't have, I don't know, but I think that he could have made some very positive changes. And I think he could have really, as I said earlier, reminded Republicans of who they were and why their party was formed in the first place. My appreciation for that aspect of his career really just grew exponentially as I was doing the research. It's fun to play the what if game, but the thing about James A. Garfield is we do know enough. We don't, we could ask what if about any president, right? And I think maybe calling him a what if is also a disservice as we were talking about calling him accidental is he's still had a life he had a full career he left volumes and volumes of writings and he he wasn't even like say a robert f kennedy who we never got to see even a day of the man as president so i like that part of it i also wanted to briefly mention there's a johnny cash song (laughs) johnny cash sings ballads of the old west right you know the song oh yes mr garfield it's really catchy people can check it out i'll link to it at historyauthor.com on the page for this episode and there's a bar that i go to sometimes in Teaneck, New Jersey, and they have it on the jukebox. Oh, wow. And I go there and I'll play it, and I could always tell that, you know, they know it's not a very big place, and they know that it's got to be me walking in and playing it. <laughs> it's called The Cottage. They listen to the show, and Mickey there behind the bar, a sweet Irish guy, just great, and he'll just laugh, and I'll, I'll play my Garfield song. They know I'm coming. So <laughs> it's just a song that reminds you. You get the feeling of the era. You get a feeling for Garfield and how people cared about him. And Johnny Cash actually also played it at Carnegie Hall after the assassination of John F. Kennedy. And he said, it's not really funny if you're not in the right frame of mind. And nobody was. (laughs) Lincoln, Kennedy, we know more about them. We're still in national mourning in some ways for them for different reasons. But Garfield's just as worthy. So is McKinley. Anybody who's assassinated, killed unjustly. I I like to really focus on remembering their lives, not just their deaths. And that's what you do for us here, talking about this election. He becomes more than a man that's just shot in the back when he's walking through a train station. Even that train station, you can't go there anymore and see this is where he was shot. And until recently, you couldn't see at all even where the train station was. I was honored that you asked me to be part of helping, winding us back here to the waysides by way of (laughs) Johnny Cash, the man in black. Tell us how you restored a little bit of his legacy, how you changed the fact that Garfield had the only site of a presidential assassination that was unmarked, and now people can see those waysides and, and realize something important happened here. We lost a man that was our chief executive. Yeah, as you said, we knew also that Garfield, of the four presidents who've been assassinated, his was the only site where there was no marker, no 
no indication at all that th this very historic event had happened there. And so we uh, basically just started trying to figure out how we would go about getting some kind of a marker near the site. Now, I have to say near because the train station in which Garfield was shot is no longer there. It was torn down in the early 20th century, and the National Gallery of Art now sits there. And the actual location, as far as anyone can tell, where Garfield was actually standing when Gateau, you know, actually approached and shot him in the back, is now in the middle of Constitution Avenue in, you know, in D.C. And so you obviously don't want people running out into the middle of the street to take a picture of a marker or something like that and, you know, having all these traffic backups and people getting hit by cars and all this kind of terrible things. So we decided, OK, well, it can't be right there on the spot. It's we've got to make it as close as we can. And then through some very good strokes of luck, I was put in touch with some National Park Service colleagues who worked on the National Mall and realized that, well, the National Mall runs right behind the National Gallery of Art. And so we were actually able to put together a team, including Candace Millard and Ken Ackerman and Heather Cox Richardson and you, Dean, and Louis Pacone, Rob Rapley, who's the guy who made the 2016 American Experience film, and Alexandra Zapruder, who is the granddaughter of Abraham Zapruder, the guy that actually recorded the Kennedy assassination. And these folks are all friends of our site now because we've gotten to know them in person through having them come and give programs at our site or through social media or whatever. We put together a team that, along with our National Park Service colleagues, were, were able to create a couple of exhibit panels that are now on the National Mall behind the National Gallery of Art. So really, I'd say probably a good about six or 700 yards from the actual spot. So you would actually need to go walk through the National Gallery and out the front to get to Constitution Avenue where the actual site was. But the benefit of putting them there on the National Mall, of course, is that it was easy to do because it's administered by the National Park Service. And of course, the foot traffic that goes by there is somewhere around 25 or 30 million people a year that walk by those panels and now hopefully stop and look and maybe learn a little something about President Garfield. When I interviewed Jim Foley at the Church of the Presidents in Long Branch, New Jersey, we talked about Grant, certainly. Grant had a real presence in the town. Unfortunately, Garfield goes there for the sea air to Elberon, New Jersey, hoping that he'll recover, that it'll help him feel better. That cottage burned down. That's gone. So that wasn't even possible either to go and, and see where he breathed his last breaths. That wasn't marked either until the 1950s. Compliments to eight-year-old Bruce Frankel. Here he was. What an eight-year-old. And he says, a president died right here on the beach, mom and dad. How come there's nothing here telling us? And I remember when I went before the internet to try to find it, I couldn't find it. And I asked the library. I figured, well, the library will know because... The eight-year-old in me always thinks librarians know how to find everything. And they didn't know. They didn't know where he was. Where was the marker? I kept driving around. I'm driving around this little town. Then I realized that the garbage truck had been parked in front of the marker. <laughs> so my persistence ultimately pays off with my wife. And we stop there. We take a picture next to that marker. That tells you, even back then, before Candace Millard's book, certainly an eight-year-old wasn't reading all about every detail of his life, probably hadn't been out to visit you fine folks at his home. He just strikes you when you read some of these little things. And I really was honored to play a small part in reminding people of his legacy so that you see that. There's no reason it shouldn't be marked. Then maybe somebody goes and they write the next great book on James A. Garfield, or they get inspired in their own lives. And maybe they're inspired by his faults and coming back as much as they are the things that he did right. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think the best historical figures are ones that we still can draw relevance from today. And certainly that is the case for Garfield, as I mentioned earlier, you know, as we, we talk about his record on civil rights and how strong it was. And now we still see that here we are almost 140 years after his death, and we're still seeing inequality and things like that going on in our society. I think that somebody like Garfield still has much to teach us. And so I'm very happy that even prior to my book, that people were really starting to come around to Garfield. And I'll give you a good example of that is you see every few years, I don't know if it's C-SPAN or some other similar type organization, they always put out those presidential polls of, you know, presidential greatness. And obviously you always expect to see Abraham Lincoln and George Washington and Franklin D. Roosevelt at the top. And in years gone by, Garfield was one of those presidents who didn't even get ranked. 
because he just wasn't there long enough. Gosh, didn't even compete. <laughs> yeah, he and William Henry Harrison were always kind of left out because they just were president so briefly. But now the most recent of those that I have looked up, Garfield does in fact get ranked and he does okay. He shows up in the, I don't know, maybe the mid thirties or something. I don't think that's too bad for a guy that was only there for six months. And of course, you know, then playing the what if game, we can say, boy, how high might he have been on this list had he lived and really been able to serve a full term or two terms? Maybe he would crack the top 10. Who knows? I'm just pleased that he shows up on the list at all now. But I do think that because of, again, some of the great books and films and things that have been made, I do, again, like to think that because of some of the work that we do at our site and and certainly on social media, you know, reaching out and trying to talk to people on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram about Garfield and post things about him, I think people are starting to wake up. And we do get people commenting on our posts on social media about it was such a tragedy when he died. It was such a loss to the country and he could have been a great president and he's my favorite president. We actually even do get people that say he's their favorite. So that just makes us feel great. Like, hey, you know, we're doing our job here. We are convincing people that this guy is worth remembering. There are plenty of horrible people in history that are worth remembering. Don't get me wrong. I mean, we need to know what horrible people have done throughout history so that those things don't happen again. But I'm very pleased that, you know, Garfield is being remembered now for good things and not for any of moral failings or personal problems that he may have had as a younger man. You know, he's being remembered as someone who was on the right side of history for a lot of reasons. And that's a nice feeling for us. Also has a very impressive final resting place. It's not far from you there at the library, his home there in Mentor, Ohio. Chester E. Arthur, also very interesting. The vice presidential candidate in 1880 turns out to be the choice of the man who will serve all but a few months of Garfield's term. You get that here in the last Lincoln Republican. You get the mechanics of it. And also that leads into all of these wars that are in the party that inspires this deranged man. I think that's important that we're reminded of that because we live in such heated times. Of just a few days before we are recording this, somebody sent rice into the White House and was caught at the Canadian border trying to escape over, probably right to where Chester Arthur was born in Canada. <laughs> just kidding. He he told that joke, right? His were the original birthers. He told a joke to a group of Republicans and said, this is just between us and hadn't even invented <laughs> microphones yet, right? But somehow he managed to have the first hot mic moment where everybody said he admits it. He's Canadian. He's not American. We knew it. We got him now. But of course, you know, they could never prove it that he wasn't born in the U.S. So he ended up serving quite nicely and surprisingly and this is a legacy of Garfield, and I think that if Garfield could have looked at it, he would have thought of it in very grand terms. Obviously, he was a dedicated Christian. He was a pastor, wasn't he, at one point in his life, he taught Sunday school? And so I, I like to think that he would have looked at that and said, well, if I had to be a martyr for the cause of civil service reform, where people were actually going to have to prove their worth to get these jobs and not just be the friend of somebody important, that that's part of his legacy, too doesn't have the role that we expect people to have today where you pick a running mate but still the fact that he was beloved that he dies and ends up leaving the presidency to arthur and arthur is inspired then to out of this broken heart he doesn't even go and speak to garfield because he has this terrible position where imagine they shoot the president and they say i did it so todd arrington would be president you go oh my god why <laughs> that like it's bad enough the president's shot it's bad enough i'm going to be thrown into this job but he's saying he did it for me and my faction uh, arthur just get and then nobody wants him around because of this he never even gets to see the president as he's as he's dying all those months does he so that's part of his legacy, too, that he's an inspiring figure in death in a way that William Henry Harrison really isn't. You know, he has a running mate who just comes in there. You mentioned Johnson, both of these guys, Democrats that run with a Republican and before that a Whig. And they don't have that pressure. They don't have that legacy that their successor feels obligated to take on in the way that, by the way, Theodore Roosevelt did for McKinley. He says after he dies that my aim is to continue unbroken the policies of my predecessor for the prosperity of this country. So that first term, or whatever it is, four years of a term, he really felt was McKinley's, and he was trying to do many of these things we just associate with TR and being a rough rider and being in the progressive era. But I wanted you to just give Arthur a few words, even though I've just said all this for him. <laughs> what role does that very cruelly laughing at me? I'll have, you know, I'm passionate about Garfield. What can I say? <laughs> but... <laughs> 
what words can you give us about how that plays into this election of 1880 that you describe in The Last Lincoln Republican? Well, certainly the factionalism in the party is really one of the things that leads to Garfield being nominated. I mean, no one really could get to the number of delegates that they needed to secure the nomination, not Grant, not Blaine, not Sherman. And so eventually the the party starts looking for a, a compromise candidate. Now, Garfield's name had been thrown about before he ever went to Chicago. And really as early as 1879, there were a few people here and there mentioning that Garfield would be a good candidate in 1880. And, you know, Garfield didn't put much stock in this, but he didn't really, you know, he was a good politician. He didn't try to tamp it down either. He just let people talk. But, you know, I don't think he would have gone to that convention if he really believed there was any chance he was actually going to be nominated. I do think it was a surprise. But the factionalism in the party is really part of what allowed that to happen. But that's also what led to somebody like Chester A. Arthur being put on the ticket. You know, the parties did all the heavy lifting of campaigns at this point. And that's another reason Garfield is so unique is that he does run this front porch campaign from his home in Menor, Ohio, which is where our site is located, where he does give speeches from the front porch, you know, not speeches like we think of them today from presidential candidates. He's not talking about himself. I mean, he's talking about the party and all this kind of stuff. But, you know, putting Arthur on the ticket really is sort of a a gift to the other faction. So, you know, Garfield at this point is thought of as more of a, a half-breed Republican and Arthur is definitely a stalwart Republican. And really the only differences on, on these two factions is the stalwarts, of course, are very loyal to Grant and they want Grant to be nominated again in 1880. And stalwarts also are vehemently opposed to civil service reform, whereas half-breeds don't like the idea of Grant running again. And they are open to the possibility of civil service reform. Although admittedly, Garfield was not all that charged up about civil service reform. Now, the irony here is that it ends up being the major issue of his very brief presidency. You know, for all the talk that I've given you for the last hour or however long about Garfield and civil rights, other than acknowledging and and really dedicating a good part of his, his inaugural address to civil rights, he doesn't get to do much about civil rights during his presidency because he is so wrapped up in this factional public fight with Roscoe Conkling, who is the senator from New York, who is kind of the king of the patronage system, patronage being the spoils system. You know, you win elections and you get to dole out jobs to whoever you want. It doesn't matter if they're qualified, doesn't matter if they're, you know, they've got any experience, you've won. And this is how you as a member of Congress establish a base of power. You, you, you have these to the victor goes the spoils. Yes, exactly. You have these wonderful things to give out, and these are jobs. And so Chester A. Arthur is an acolyte of Roscoe Conkling. I mean, he owes his entire career, which, by the way, includes exactly zero jobs that he's been elected to. He's never held elective office until he's elected vice president. And so he owes his entire career to Conkling. And so when the Republicans at the convention approach Arthur about you know, knowing they want a New Yorker on the ticket with Garfield because New York is going to be the critical state in this election. They approach Arthur and Arthur goes to Conkling and says, they've offered me the vice presidency. And Conkling says, you should drop it as you would drop a hot shoe out of the forge. <laughs> Horse metaphor. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Or something along those lines. And, and Arthur, surprisingly enough, tells Conkling, well, the vice presidency is a higher honor than I ever thought I would attain and I'm going to accept it. And so then, of course, Garfield is, is shot, and it turns out that Charles Guiteau, the assassin, you know, sees himself as this stalwart Republican, and, and he's opposing civil service reform. And so when Garfield dies and Arthur becomes president, a lot of people, including Roscoe Conkling, think that, well, things are going to be grand for us again because our guy Chet, our man Chet, is now president. And to his credit, and I think Arthur is also underappreciated as a, as a historical figure. Arthur says, no, he's not going to become a puppet as president for guys like Roscoe Conkling and, and U.S. Grant. He's going to be his own man and ends up in January of 1883 signing the Pendleton Act, which is the act that, that begins the reform of the civil service to a merit-based rather than a spoils system. And so, you know, I think Arthur also not perfect. He also signs the Chinese Exclusion Act, I mean, which is very widely panned by historians, rightfully so. So Arthur's not perfect either. He and Garfield both are human beings. 
and you know make mistakes and and maybe support some things that that in the long run we can say now with 140 years of hindsight were, were bad ideas but but I do think Arthur deserves a, at least a little bit of credit for rejecting the idea of just turning all power over to guys like Conkling and becoming his own man and I, I liken Arthur to like a Lyndon Johnson in that Arthur is saying reforming the civil service is a tribute to James Garfield's memory just as Lyndon Johnson portrayed, you know, signing the Civil Rights Act of 1964 as a tribute to the memory of President Kennedy, even though now, you know, we can kind of look back and say, well, Kennedy took a while to really get on board with with moving on civil rights. It took him over two years to really start talking about civil rights. And then a few months later, he's assassinated. Arthur and, and Johnson, in my mind, for that similarity there, do have something in common. Johnson waving a different sort of bloody shirt, I guess you might say, to push a lot of these things. And also, sure, sure. Arthur doesn't have the stain of Vietnam on his resume, and in part because <laughs> he's facing his own death at the time. And Lyndon Johnson was very sick, and yet another book, Betty Boyd Caroli, Lady Bird and Lyndon, a wonderful book. It was frightening, really, that we could have had somebody like Johnson. It's a very stark portrait of, of his failings, speaking of people that had failings, but yet we can look at and say, hey, this was one that you got right straight down the middle of the lane, a strike on things like civil rights out of that presidency. Right. There's even a scandal I did want to mention. If you know your friends are talking about Watergate and Monica Lewinsky, Teapot Dome, Ukraine, Russia, <laughs> you could really impress them by whipping out Credit Mobilier. <laughs> Interesting scandal. Probably the closest thing that I could think of was President George W. Bush in 2004, political foes using a forged letter. And this is what happens with Garfield, where they try to throw this at him. But even a fake scandal, as we all know, can hurt you if it hits you at the wrong time, if you're not an adept politician, if you don't handle it well. So that is also here in The Last Lincoln Republican. I wanted to ask you one final question. You've had all this experience making clear why Garfield matters. Tell listeners who are hearing this, maybe they're just hearing two history nerds speaking because <laughs> I failed to bring out the best in you. That's my fault if they do. So let's wrap that up by you, the professional, making the pitch as the site manager of the Garfield National Historic Site. Explain to people, even if they're tired of electioneering, why should they pick up the last Lincoln Republican? Why should they go back 140 years to get into the heat of this campaign? Well, that's, that's a great question. And y <laughs> yeah, I guess I hoped that maybe people would be paying more attention to politics now. And so this was a perfect time for this book to come out. But I guess what I should have thought was people may be tired of politics already. Maybe the last thing anyone wants to read about right now is politics, even if it is from 140 years ago. But I do think that Garfield obviously has great relevance to today. First of all, he was a president of the United States, so he's not inconsequential simply for that reason. Any president is important, whether they're William Henry Harrison, who only serves for a month, or they're Franklin D. Roosevelt, who you know, is elected four times. These guys are setting policy and they are putting things into motion that are going to affect the country for years and years to come or potentially forever. Garfield is no different. I think he's really interesting for a lot of reasons. I talked about his views on civil rights, the idea that he ran the nation's first front porch campaign. He was one of the first presidential candidates to really directly communicate with the public. You know, keep in mind at this point in American history, candidates don't campaign for themselves. And in fact, that is frowned upon because it's seen as kind of being unseemly almost. The office at this point, it was felt should seek the man, not the man seeking the office. And I say man because, of course, at this point, they're all men, other than Victoria Woodhull, of course. No women running popular campaigns for the presidency at this point. So he's, he's unique in that regard. So if you're really into politics now, and you're really into election season and you love following polls and all this kind of stuff, you know, you can kind of thank James Garfield for that. His was one small step on the road to the more modern style of campaigning in that he did talk to people. He did give speeches during his campaign and he paid very close attention to his own campaign behind the scenes. You know, he had a telegraph running into the one small outbuilding in his on his property here in Ohio that where he could get news and and all this kind of stuff. Now, on the flip side of that, if you're somebody who hates politics and you're you can't stand these presidential campaigns that basically begin the minute an election ends. So, you know, you've got people running for president for the next four years. I guess you can blame James Garfield for some of that because, again, 
he was somebody who did kind of break the mold a little bit on presidential campaigning in that 1880 front porch campaign. But I think it's also worth mentioning 1880 is pretty interesting in that it's it's the only time we have two candidates running against each other who are both Union Civil War veterans. It's the first instance of the really solid South for the Democrats. And of course, we think of the solid South today in terms of it being solid for Republicans. So that shows you how much the parties have, have changed over the years. But it was the first instance of the solid South for the uh, for the Democrats. But it's also interesting that you know, we talked earlier about 1876. So in 1876, Samuel Tilden, the Democrat, wins the popular vote. Then we have 1880, James Garfield, the Republican, wins the popular vote. Then we have 1884, where Grover Cleveland, the Democrat, wins the popular vote and becomes president. Then we have 1888, where Grover Cleveland, the incumbent, wins the popular vote but loses the Electoral College and therefore is not reelected. Benjamin Harrison becomes president. Then you have four years later, 1892, Cleveland comes back and beats Harrison, wins the popular vote. So of all those elections, 1876, 1880, 1884, 1888, 1892, five elections, Garfield is the only Republican that wins the popular vote in those five elections. So we think of the Republicans having this stranglehold on the presidency after the Civil War, and for the most part, they did. But really, in the, those five elections, the Democrats all but one won the popular vote. Didn't necessarily always win the Electoral College, but it shows just how much the parties were changing and how both parties were kind of in transition. In 1880, by a very thin margin, admittedly, the, the country decided that the vision Garfield had for the future was, was the better vision. And it's just a shame that we didn't get to see much much more of what that vision might have meant for the future of the country. Well, Todd Arrington, I hope that the listeners enjoyed our conversation. Get a little bit more in history than those big three presidents you mentioned at the top and some of the exciting ones like a Theodore Roosevelt or a Dwight D. Eisenhower that are very exciting and interesting. Spare a little time here to meet James A. Garfield. Stop by the James A. Garfield National Historic Site in Mentor, Ohio, if you can. Or the next best thing, pick up the last Lincoln Republican. Meet this president who is really taking the country by storm, I would say. (laughs) I say catch Garfield fever. Maybe I'm a little bit biased. He was more than just this blur of bearded Gilded Age presidents. He had an interesting path to the White House. It was by no means a sure thing that he would win and that the progress that the freedmen had made would not be rolled back. We can do more than ask what if with Garfield. I'm really glad you did that in the last Lincoln Republican. I learned something about an election I didn't know, and it was a lot of fun to talk with you today. So thanks so much, Todd, and the best of luck to everybody out there at the James A. Garfield National Historic Site. Thank you very much, Dean. I appreciate you having me on. Again, the book is The Last Lincoln Republican, The Presidential Election of 1880. As always, you can find the Amazon link to purchase your copy at the historyauthor.com page for this episode. By buying this book or any other book that I talk about here on the show through our website, you help keep the flux capacitor on our time machine humming like usual. My thanks to Todd Arrington for joining us today. It's always great to interview somebody who I've spoken to for years and has shared their love of history with me. Now, thanks to his book, you can enjoy his passion, too. The way he promotes General Garfield's legacy makes you feel as if he's really still alive and sitting here with us. And this gives us an insight into the leadership choice that faced Americans as the post-Civil War turmoil rocked the nation, as people just got tired of hearing about the freedmen, and they wanted to bring the boys home, like other wars where we've wanted to stop having to have an occupying force in an enemy nation, and everybody was aiming for reconciliation. Too often that meant selling out fellow Americans because of the color of their skin. I also want to give special thanks to Candace Millard for scripting that question for Todd, and for her wonderful book on the 20th President's Legacy, That's Destiny of the Republic, a tale of madness, medicine, and the murder of a president. You can also find my interview with her about her book, Hero of the Empire. The Boer War, A Daring Escape, and The Making of Winston Churchill. Plus, you can look forward to my interview with Ben Justison about his book, Forgotten Legacy, William McKinley, George Henry White, and the Struggle for Black Equality. 
Remember, you can visit the James A. Garfield National Historic Site at nps.gov slash jaga or on Facebook and Twitter at the handle GarfieldNPS. And you can find me on Twitter at History Dean, Instagram, and Facebook. Thank you for listening to this installment of the History Author Show. I hope you'll join us next time for an all-new interview right here on iHeartRadio. And if you're an iTunes subscriber, please take a minute to leave us a review. Until our next trip into the past together, thanks so much for time traveling with us back to the election of 1880, and have a great week. We still call it Broadway, but what's in a name? Take it from Georgie, it isn't the same. On the east side, west side, things ain't like before. There are tears in the eyes of the regular guys. Oh, New York ain't New York anymore.